Good afternoon and welcome to another A Push video with Mr. Pay for Barlow High School. Today we're looking at the American causes of the American Revolution. Our essential question for today is what were the short and long and short term causes of the American Revolution? Let's look at the long term causes first, going back a while. The First Great Awakening. In the early 1700s, the First Great Awakening is going to be a religious revival that occurs. It is going to be um, the rise of a bunch of new American or predominantly American denominations. It is going to be a breaking away from the Church of England, also called the Anglican Church. With this happening, the Anglican Church being headed by the King of England, the Anglican Church being directly tied to the British government, as people are breaking away from the Church of England to other denominations, they have their own kind of religious awakening and they're not as tight. It's like fracturing the bond a little bit, okay? The Enlightenment. You've got Locke and Hobbes, okay, from Great Britain itself. You've got Rousseau and Montesquieu. And you have people, basically, that are these philosophers theorizing ideas about having a republic and how monarchy is wrong and people should be able to get rid of a bad government. These things, as these ideas percolate and become more widespread, and the American population is pretty well read, uh, as these things are well read, uh, you know, become spread, you're going to see, again, people start to question authority a little bit more. The French and Indian War. you got several things going on. Number one, the French and Indians, okay, the, the Indians fight on both sides, but the French are against the British. It's a battle for Pittsburgh and the wider Ohio River Valley. It spreads into a global war, and the French lose. The British win. Several things going on. The American colonists get some fighting experience in this, and some of them become like junior officers like George Washington. They also have exposure to the very brutal, harsh treatment of the British officers, and generally what they consider the, the immoral, bad behavior of the British soldiers. Going back to the First Great Awakening, they see themselves as kind of like morally superior. The bond is continuing to dissolve. So leaving the French and Indian War, the good thing for the British is they take basically Canada and don't have conflict in the Ohio River Valley. The French are removed from North America. But the problems are they have a massive amount of debt from the war now. And they have increased costs to operate North America because they have a lot more land. Now they have to basically try and make sure that French population in Canada is going to work with them. They've got Native Americans to deal with, and of course, keeping the peace with the British and American colonies. So, they've got these extra costs and this debt to deal with, and these are significant issues for them. So the question becomes how to pay off this debt, and the solutions end up becoming some of the short-term British actions. So let's go ahead and look at those. The British actions. First one, the Proclamation of 1763. The idea here is that the colonists would not be allowed to move from beyond, well, from east of the Appalachian Mountains west and traverse across them. Why? Because Native Americans were out to the west and they were going to fight. And the, the British are saying, we don't want that increased cost. So they cut a deal with Pontiac and the other Native American leaders saying, it, we promise, if you promise us peace, we will not allow the colonists to move out to the west. One of the main reasons the colonists fight in the American, uh, the French and Indian War is they want to move west. So this is a slap in the face after they have served on the winning side. It results in colonist anger. So they're trying to limit costs here. It's a cost-saving measure. Sugar Act. Okay, the Sugar Act. Now, sugar obviously is a pretty popular thing today. It certainly was back then. But basically what had happened is, remember we talked in a previous video about those navigation acts put into place, but then solitary neglect happens. They don't enforce them well from really 1650 until the end of the French and Indian War in 1763. And with that, now they're saying we need to clamp down. This is a way to like squeeze some more money out of existing revenue sources. Let's stop smuggling. What did the Navigation Act say? Well, for instance, if you have somebody in the United States, or the American colonies, I should say, they would have to come up to Great Britain before they could go trade anywhere else in Europe. They would have to sail up here and only trade with the British or with British colonies, say, in the West Indies, or they would have to stop and pay the British some money before they went somewhere else. Either way, it's raising the costs for the British of operating. Okay? 
excuse me, for the American colonists because of the British's policy. Also, they start, so, so what do the Americans do? They try and smuggle. Instead of going there, they try and avoid the British Navy and go trade wherever they want. Well, they get away with this for, you know, to a large extent for quite a while. So the Sugar Act is designed to stop this and punish those smugglers. Writs of assistance. If you got caught as a smuggler, you would go to a vice admiralty court, which means instead of a jury of your peers, say in Massachusetts, in Boston, you might go um, up into British Canada and have a military tribunal court, basically, and that was not going to be very sympathetic to you. You'd get the hammer dropped on you. Also, general warrants. General warrants were the idea that you would have um, like a search warrant, but it never ended, and it was for anything. In the United States today, it has to be specific to the time, the place, what you're looking for, what your probable cause is, approved by a judge. Once this general warrant was in place, it never ended, and it was for anything related to a person. It wasn't a specific place one time or anything. This is going to be a direct cause of the Fourth Amendment, okay? Again, colonist anger is going to emerge. John Hancock, he's a smuggler. Whose name's biggest on the Declaration of Independence? John Hancock. He wanted to stick it to the British and make a point. Stamp Act. Okay, the Stamp Act is now a direct tax that the British put on the Americans. And every time you would have a paper document, playing cards, newspaper, magazine, book, whatever, there would be a legal document. You would have to pay a stamp tax and put a stamp on there to show that you had actually paid that thing. Well, this is going to result in a wide variety of colonist responses. The Stamp Act Congress, you're going to have colonies getting together and they write a unified statement rejecting the stamp tax saying, Taxation without representation, it's unfair, and, and blah, blah, blah. Sons of Liberty. Sons of Liberty are going to be, you know, kind of this guerrilla group that's going to launch some attacks and destroy property and intimidate and basically gum things up for the British quite a bit. They form, and then you're going to have boycotts. The colonies are going to say, fine, we're not buying anything British. Well, that's going to be the most effective weapon of all because now, oh, they also, the Sons of Liberty are like, attacking the tax collectors, tar and feathering them, burning their houses down. So they intimidate them so no one even collects the tax, basically. The boycotts make the British manufacturers mad at the British government, so they pull the tax off. Two years later, Townshend Acts. This is another attempt, but instead of the direct tax that you see as you buy the product, now this is an offshore tax placed on before the goods came ashore on raw materials such as glass and... Uh, tea and, and some other products. And so the Townshend Acts, again, it's another way to try and collect taxes. The Stamp Act, the Townshend Act, the Tea Act, you're talking about generating new revenue to pay down that debt from the French and Indian War. Townshend Act results in a form of committees of correspondence. This is bad for the British because it is going to be communications that are kind of permanent between the colonies about problems with the British. So it's an us versus them mentality, be gaining more traction, becoming more in, entrenched. Sons of Liberty and boycotts reemerge, and the British are forced to pull off the Townshend Acts as well. Tea Act. They decide to leave the tax, tax on tea, and they even drop the price a little bit to help out a struggling major company called the East India Trading Company. Okay, But the Americans know they're still being taxed. The British are trying to keep alive the principle of taxation. So this results in the Boston Tea Party done by the Sons of Liberty. Sons of Liberty do this. It actually alienated some Americans. They're like, you guys are idiots. You're going too far. Until the coercive acts happen. The British punishment is very strong. The coercive acts shut down Boston Harbor. They dissolve the, the British, I mean, the Massachusetts colonial legislature. And they had military occupation of Boston until they, they paid back this money. So the hammers dropped. Now, the British purpose here is to teach a lesson. If we punish them harshly, no one will ever do, dare to do this again. But that's not how it's received. Everyone else looks at like, hey, if they're doing this right now, we're next. It's going to happen to us regardless. They're dropping the hammer. They're stealing all of our liberties. We can't accept this. The boycotts return. You have a homespun movement that, that you know, kind of, kind of started happening up here, but it's really going to kick into gear. You have women, like, making homemade clothes, sending them to Massachusetts foodstuffs being sent to Massachusetts, and you have these committees of correspondence going on with more of a permanent air discussing the issues with the British in different areas. First Continental Congress is going to be a result of the committee's correspondence, and the biggest thing that First Continental Congress does is they form what's called the Association. This is a permanent boycott system among all the colonies.
So things are going from bad to worse. As all of these things are happening, searching for the Sons of Liberty and stashes of weapons, you eventually get um, Lexington and Concord and the Second Continental Congress. In Lexington and Concord, of course, you have bloodshed that goes down, and you know now hostilities have kind of violently commenced. The Second Continental Congress is going to come in, and now you're getting into Bunker Hill, and the colonists are going to come out with the Olive Branch Petition. And I think you know, there are other things that they introduced, but this is really the most important one because you still had a faction of American colonists that were loyalist, and you had another faction that were kind of on the fence, and then you had a faction that were patriot. The ones that were kind of on the fence, they went with the loyalists and said, let's appeal to the king to just go back and have a do-over. So they actually say that. King, our issue is with Parliament, not with you. We still want you to be our king. Let's have a big do-over. Tell Parliament to get rid of these onerous taxes. Let's go back to the way things were. The king rejects it out of hand, won't even listen to it. And this is going to sway the, those fence-sitters and even a, a few of the most moderate loyalists to go to the patriot side. And once that happens, revolution becomes inevitable. You end up with common sense and the declaration later on in 1776. That's all the time we have for today. Stay classy, Sam Barlow.